All right, then I think we can resume. Now we'll have a little bit of a different topic and Matthias will present a flash talk about the cooperation and interrogations, the role of matching. Matthias, if you would like to share your screen. Yep. Thank you very much. So to save some time, I'm actually pre-recorded my talk. Let's see. All right, hopefully you can all see that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm All right, hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. So my name is Matthias and today I will be talking about sense making and cooperation in interrogations uh, and specifically the role of matching. But first, what is sense making then? Well, sense making relates to a model that was developed by my supervisor, Paul Taylor, back in 2002. And he looked at crisis negotiation interactions and he found that when people spoke during those interactions, they tended to frame their messages around one of three main motivational frames. And these were instrumental, relational, and identity. So when people frame their messages around instrumental frames, they largely answer questions about what, when, how. So basically factual information. When people frame their messages around relational motivations, they tended to either build up the relationship they had with the other person, so saying things like thank you, or attacking the other person and breaking down the relationship. So things, saying things like piss off or I don't like you, for example. Finally, when people frame their messages around identity concerns, they spoke about their fears, their worries, their needs and values and so on. So sense making really relates to identifying how another person is framing their communication and then trying to match, match those frames. And there's been some correlational research showing that when people match based on these motivational frames, that tends to lead to more or better negotiations or interaction success. However, as you all know, correlation does not imply causation. So what we wanted to know and investigate in our research is can we manipulate matching based on these motivational frames experimentally? And would that matching actually lead to more willingness to cooperate and provide information and also trust the interrogator? So the way we investigated that was that we had participants read a brief interview transcript, and this was a transcript between a suspect and an interrogator. We then told them during this interaction to please imagine being the suspect. So while you're reading this transcript, please put yourself in the suspect's shoes and think about how you would experience things from their perspective, basically. So the full design looks like this. So we have a matching condition where the suspect and the interrogator completely matches based on these motivational frames and we have a non-matching condition where they do not match. We also cross that with either an interaction that was more cooperative in nature compared and also an um, interaction that was more competitive in nature. Finally, we asked participants whether they were willing to cooperate with the interrogator, whether they felt understood by the interrogator, whether they were willing to identify with the interrogator and finally whether they trusted the interrogator. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we found that a friendly and positive interaction led to higher willingness to cooperate, feeling more understood, identify and trust the interviewer. So there was a main effect here of the orientation that, that the suspect and interrogator took to the interaction. We also found that in a cooperative interaction, matching based on these motivational frames led to greater feelings of being understood, identify and trust the interrogator. So this would suggest that matching is a positive thing and leads to positive outcome variables in this case. However, we also found that in a competitive interaction, matching actually led to less cooperation and identification with the interrogator. So in other words, there was an interaction here between matching and the orientation that the suspect and interrogator took towards the interaction. That's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. All right, that was uh, indeed a flash talk. Um, thank you very much. Uh, there are no questions as of now, so do feel free um, still to post some. Um, otherwise, I shall start with what I found very interesting is um, the idea that 
they have to get into the role of the in, um, interrogated person themselves. Do you think that based on the situation, there could be task demands that um, influence your results? Or were the, the scripts so, I don't know, um, deep uh, that you don't think that they completely saw through the, the aim of the study? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think probably there could be. Um, yeah, I mean, we still, there's always the question whether it's reliable to ask people to put themselves, you know, in another person's shoes and actually whether they are doing it or not. Uh, I think this was, a, or this was an online study, and I think probably that's a more valid question in online studies than perhaps other studies, because you don't know if people are really fully paying attention to uh, what they are supposed to be paying attention to. Mm. Yeah, so that's a tricky one, actually. I think due to, you know, um, the corona situation and everything, we have had to kind of put things online, but that, you know, that's a good because you can get participants, but the bad thing about it is that you don't have control over whether your participants are actually paying attention. Um, so there are a lot of things or some things that you misses when you're doing that. So where did you get the, the transcripts from? Did uh, yeah, so they, they were kind of influenced by some um, real transcripts that we have from the US Air Force. Uh, mm -hmm. But we obviously had to kind of take, you know, strip them of all the identical um, identity information. And also we kind of altered them a little bit just to make sure that we you couldn't read um, into this transcript and then figure out who the person actually was. Um, okay. So they were, they were more influenced, you can say. They were not really um, taken straight away from these, these US Air Force transcripts. But really cool that you had actual transcripts available to use. Yeah, so I'm very lucky to have that for my supervisor, actually. Um, yeah, so that's good. All right, um, still no other questions, then I'm going to follow up. Um, do you think that the findings would apply in a real interrogation situation and not just in the lab? I mean, a little bit of a follow up, I guess. Yeah, that's also a good question. I think probably this has to be seen as kind of the first, you know, study that can explore an effect, but then whether that effect would translate to a real interrogation, interrogation situation, that's a good question. I think there needs to be several studies, you know, from the lab and, and building up to more ecologically valid situations. Um, yeah, so I, I guess you should, you know, you should be careful uh, as with all studies about kind of overgeneralizing the results to those real interrogation situations. Um, yeah. So I just say it's, it's a very you know small small step, um, and yeah, we should be careful into over generalizing, over interpreting our results. Fair enough. And maybe do you think because we had a, a talk earlier on about metacognition, do you think that that is a necessary part for this to work in a real life um, interrogation? That maybe your participants had this metacognition as a task while um, in, in real life situations that might not actually happen by itself as much? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. And I think obviously in, an interrogation, in a real interrogation situation, there are a lot of things that compete for your attention. Um, so whether people actually are able to hold a lot of competing things in their minds at the same time, for example, thinking, okay, I'm, I should match with this person right now, and this person is saying this, so I should say this and so on. Uh, whether that's realistic to expect people to actually be able to hold all, you know, all of these kind of cognitive, cognitively demanding tasks in their head at the same time. That's quite an interesting question and perhaps we need to simplify the sort of the model in order to make it useful in practice. That could probably be one way perhaps or yeah, that could be a potential um, sort of when we draw it further out in the field that we realize that it's too complex. People cannot cope with this much information, so we need to s simplify it even more. Fair enough, but thank you very much. Um, well, then I guess we'll have a short break until 35 or a bit sooner if, if we wanted to. And um, thank you very much for your really interesting talk, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>